All right, but now we're still in our playlist, God's playlist, and on his great, great songs that he has on his playlist is Psalm 73. Some of you spotted it by now. We got a little typo in the bulletin. On the top of the sermon notes, it says Psalm 42. Uh, that was a copy-paste mistake from last week. You see, even the preacher makes mistakes. If you don't believe that, ask my wife. <laughs> All right. Psalm 73, I call this, you got to go to church. This message is about the difference of attending church can make in your life. Now, just last fall, Roger Zeller gave me an article from Christianity Today, and in this article from Christianity Today was research done by Harvard, you know, the great institution, and it was on their family studies division, and that division pulled together all these scholars, and they did this research to find out what difference going to church makes. Now, listening to it on the radio is good. Streaming it online is probably a little better. But the article says it's no replacement for going to church. Wow. I thought that's pretty interesting. Well, I got this chart up here. I, I redid their chart so you could see. The difference attending church can make, in the first category, they all have to do with your risk. People who go to church have less risky lives, was the conclusion of the article. They have healthier lives. Because the first category, if your risk is 100% of death, going to church reduces it down to just 65%. Whoa, you are 45%, no, what would that be, 35%, 35% less likely to die if you go to church. Now, if I haven't convinced you to go to church, that alone should convince you to go to church. <laughs> All right, now you who are online, you're going to get the idea that the message really isn't for them here because they're in church. <laughs> this part might hurt a little bit. Because the message is really for you who are not at church. Listen, if you want to reduce your risk of dying, you go to church. Now, that's not all. This is what the study found. Look at Your suicide risk is down to 15%. You're 85% less likely to commit suicide if you go to church. Isn't that wonderful? Wow. I think it's just great, just great. Hey, our next category is depression. We talked about depression last week. But if you go to church, you are, what, 30% less likely to be depressed. Just going to church. Just going to church. Now, here's the next category. This is called divorce risk. Those who attend church, they go to church are 50% less likely to have a divorce than those who do not go to church. Wow. If you want to help your marriage, you go to church. It's just that simple. You want to help your marriage? You go to church. But I don't like the preacher. Go anyway. Help your marriage. <laughs> I don't like the singing. Go anyway. Help your marriage. Are you, are you getting the drift here? Going to church is healthy for you. The next one is women's despair. Watch. Oh, my goodness. That's all the way down to like just 32%. As opposed to not going to church. You want to go to church. Listen, men's despair. I think couldn't figure this one out. Men don't despair that much. It drops 35%, and there's drops like, what, 65%? Men, though, maybe we don't despair as much because we probably caused the despair. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure. I didn't dig that far into the research. But in any case, teens using illegal drugs drops. Look at that. 35% it drops just because they go to church. Wow. Is this amazing? Is this amazing? The last one surprised me because teen depression is dropped. Depression, teen to drop, is only about 15%. Probably because 
the teenage years are the most whacked out weird years of your life. <laughs> and depression runs high in those years. But look at even for the teen who doesn't want to go to church, perhaps drug to church, it reduces their risk of depression. Is this amazing? Here's what I'm trying to say. you got to go to church. And for those who are watching online and you could come to church, but you're not coming to church, there's another reason why you need to go to church. In Hebrews 10.25, it says, Let us not give up meeting together. You know what's happening? The Hebrew Christians were being persecuted by the Jews for having converted to Jesus Christ. And one point in the book, he says, well, you haven't even been tempted to the point of shedding your blood. You haven't had any tests so far that, that it's caused you a bloody nose or, or somebody just beating the daylights out of you. And he says, well, listen, let us not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing. Oh. You know, I love streaming because we got people who are snowbirds and they went to Florida and they're watching our service online. Thank you for joining us today. We have people in Arizona, thank you. In Texas, thank you for joining us today. But it's a double-edged sword. It helps us and it harms us. Some have gotten out of the habit of going to church. And this passage is saying, I don't care if it's your fear of COVID, they had the fear of persecution, going to church, coming back, and finding all their goods gone, destroyed, wiped out because of persecution. He says, let us not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing. Let, but instead, let us encourage one another. That's what we find at church, encouragement. When you're home alone and watching it, you only get the encouragement from the sermon or the music. You probably don't even sing with it, I'm guessing. But here, how could you not sing this morning? Were those great songs? Oh my goodness. And they encourage us, and they build us up, and it says, all the more as you see the day approaching, there's a day of accountability coming. So he says, go to church. Wow, I have all that to get us to our psalm. That was my introduction. I don't usually do that long of an introduction, but hang in there with me. The sermon's even longer. <laughs> <laughs> He's going to talk about entering the sanctuary. Entering the sanctuary. Now you say, well, we don't have a sanctuary. That was Israel. They had a temple. They had a sanctuary. But Romans says, for everything that was written in the past, in the Old Testament, was written to teach us. Who? Us? The New Testament people. So that through endurance and encouragement of the Scriptures, we might have hope. So in our passage today that's going to talk about the sanctuary, I'm going to equate it to the church, even the though the church is not the temple sanctuary. The application intended from the Old Testament into the New is for us entering into the place of worship, the house of the Lord. Here's my premise. It's actually his premise. The premise is this, and I think this is my first fill in the blank. God is only good to his people. Now, I take that from the very first part of the psalm, Psalm 73, 1. It's a psalm of Asaph. Asaph is the writer that is inspired by God to record the Holy Scriptures. And this is a song. It's, a, it's, a, it's emotional and it's musical. And he says, Surely God is good to Israel. Israel is his people. Surely, I translate it as only. God is only good to his people. I want you to say something with me, all right? God is only good. Say that with me. God is only good to his people. He adds to those who are pure in heart, those who have given their hearts over to Jesus, and Jesus has cleansed them. Remember that verse? Come, let us reason together. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. He cleanses us of our sins. So if we confess our sin, He's faithful and just to forgive us. <clears throat> we are the people of a pure heart. He says here, and this is the premise, it's the foundation that we build everything upon. God is only good to His people. Here's the problem. <laughs> we know that's true. We know that's true. He says, but I am on slippery slopes. You ever been on a slippery slope? 
I lived on a slippery slope. When I lived uh, pastoring in the First Baptist Church of Muskegon, we lived in Norton Shores, and it was a suburb of Muskegon, and we were not, not even, I don't know, maybe an eighth of a mile, a short distance, to Lake Michigan. And we lived on a dune. We're the one that the Bible says built their house on the sand. Yeah, <clears throat> that was our house on top of the dune. To get up the driveway, you had to have, in the wintertime, because it snowed every day. Aren't you glad you're on this side of the state? Ooh. My wife is. She checks the weather every day to see, oh, did it snow there? Oh, it snowed there, but it didn't snow here. We love it here. Anyway, <clears throat> one time I, I go out, and I, I'm checking to see if I need to snow, uh, sh shovel my snow. And uh, if it was three inches or more, I did. If it was less than that, I let the sun take care of it, because the way our house faced, the sun would clean it off. But so I got out there and it was, I forgot that it had rained and frozen and then snowed on top of it. And while I was checking it, I slipped and I slid all the way down the dune, all the way across the street to my neighbor's yard. <laughs> Good thing no traffic was coming. I know what it is like to be on slippery slopes. So here's the foolish thing I did. I started back up and realized, oh, oh, I can't walk on the drive because there's ice under there. So I walked on the grass. I'm going up the grass now. Oh, that worked. I get to the top, get my shovel. I didn't put my cleats on the bottom of my boots. I stepped out one foot, hit that ice again, and I did it all over again. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Listen, slippery slopes. Listen, this is what the psalmist says. I know that God is only good, but as for me... My feet had almost slipped. I had nearly lost my foothold. On what? That God is only good. There are things that happen in our lives that make us question, is God really only good? And he says, that's where I was at. Well, what was causing that? Why was he doing that? Why was he, why was he on slippery slopes? <clears throat> because he focused on the unchurched. He focused on the unchurched. What do you mean? He said, I saw that the unchurched were prosperous. They didn't go to church and everything was going fine with them. I envied the arrogant. <coughs> Excuse me. When I saw the prosperity of the wicked, he said, I got envious because I saw their prosperity and they didn't go to church. Why is that? He moves on, he says, they're always carefree. They have no struggles. Their bodies are healthy and strong, and they're free from the burdens common to man, and they are, they're not plagued by human ills. I, I see a person who worships the Lord, and they're struck down with an illness, a cancer, a heart disease, and then I see this person over, they live, they live like the devil. And they're as healthy as can be. He says, I see that, and he says, I, I begin to question. My foothold on that God is only good starts to slip. I I'm moving, my feet are moving. He says, they are proud, they're full of pride. In their, they wear pride as their necklace, and they clothe themselves with violence. They don't care about anybody else. They're so proud, they think that they're number one. They are so hard-hearted. From their calloused hearts comes iniquity and evil conceits of their minds know no limits. They do all kinds of hard-hearted, sinful things. And here they seem to be prospering just fine. Just fine. My feet were slipping. My feet were slipping bad. They are arrogant and they scoff and they speak with malice, hatred, bitterness, anger, rage. In their arrogance, they, they, threaten, uh, they threaten oppression. They're, they're going to take advantage of you, the good person, because they're so proud of themselves. He says they scoff and they speak with malice and their arrogance and they threaten in their mouths. They lay claim to heaven itself and their tongues take possession of the earth. They think that they are God. They take claim to heaven. It's the same sin of, uh, of Satan himself, that he's going to arise and be the most high like God. They're arrogant. They are selfish. Therefore, their people turn to them 
and drink up water in abundance. You say, that is a weird statement. It is. It's idiomatic, and we have something like it. They suck all the air out of the room, so there's nothing left for us. <laughs> you get the picture? They're drinking up all the water, and they give none to us. They're, they're taking everything. They possess everything. They're the ones who hoard it all, and, and they're not generous to give to others. They're the priest and the Levite. When the Samaritan has been beaten up and left on the side of the road, they see it and say, yeah, government will take care of it. Instead of stopping and helping and being, you know, the good Samaritan. Listen, they suck out all the air in the room. They're selfish. It's all about them, and they are blasphemous. They say, how can God know does the Most High have knowledge? They question God, and it's like they set themselves above God, and now they've got, God is supposed to give an account to them, so they're challenging God. They are saying blasphemous things, and we have this foundation. God is only good to His people, and here's the dilemma that He's faced with. If God is good, then why do the wicked prosper. Now, has that ever run across your mind? <laughs> yeah, mine too. All of us. If God is good, why do evil people prosper? Why is there a Putin? Why was there a Hitler? Why? If God is good, all, the, all these questions are just, boom. And this is the way he put it. This is what the wicked are like. Always carefree. Doesn't matter what's going on. Oh, they're so carefree. They increase in wealth. They are prosperous. They are prosperous. And then he says this. Ask that question. Why do the wicked prosper? And why do I feel like it's all for nothing? Surely in vain I have kept my heart pure. Why do I bother to go to church? Why do I read my Bible? Why do I even bother to pray? If it doesn't seem to matter, the wicked don't do any of those things, and look, things are going just fine for them. You see where he's at? And this is his dilemma. His dilemma. He says, it's not fair. All day long, I have been plagued. <laughs> you notice where the attention's going now? Towards me. Remember what we said about de depression last week? You got a circumstance you don't like, you respond with anger, you multiply it by self-pity, and you wind up depressed. <laughs> it's exactly true. All day long I've been plagued. I have been punished every morning. I said, I have nothing to get up for. Life is not fair. That's where he's at. This is his dilemma. And so he said, because I'm, I'm a believer, I have to watch what I say. He said, if I had said, I will speak thus, I would have betrayed your children. Now, that doesn't make a whole lot of sense. So I found it in the Net Bible. I like the New English translation. And, and it put it this way. If I had publicized these thoughts, if I had spoken my mind about God's not fair, poor me, all that, he said, I would have betrayed your loyal followers. I don't want to be guilty of misleading somebody else, he's saying. And so I've been watching what I say because I don't want it to slip that I got doubt in my heart. Hmm. Isn't that how we come to church sometimes? We put on the Sunday face. How about the couple that's arguing in the car before they pull in the parking lot? As soon as they get out of the car, they come in and, Hello, how are you? Oh, I'm wonderful. I'm fine. <laughs> Why? We don't want anybody to know about the little, little mishap that we had verbally on the way to church. And that's the way we are with our doubts. We don't want anybody to know that I'm struggling here, so I'm going to pretend to be on top of it. But the guy is struggling. He's got this dilemma. He's got this dilemma. And it depresses me. In fact, it's really stronger than that. Uh, when I tried to understand all this, it was oppressive to me. The word oppressive, I put depressive there, but it's oppressive. He says, it was just trouble and frustration. It was hard. It was work. 
You know, when you are depressed, that's the way it is. Just get out of bed. <laughs> right? Yeah, it's work. He said, when I, I tried to understand all this, I have a dilemma. God, you're only good, but the things I see in the world just seem not, not to line up with the fact that you're only good. And he said, I, I got a problem here. And finally, we come to the solution. And the solution is, you got to go to church. Right? It was oppressive to me till I entered the sanctuary of God. Wow. Isn't that great? Man, my mind was so messed up about everything. My foot was losing its, its uh, hold on the ground. I was going down because I focused on the world. You know who that reminds me of? This wasn't in my sermon notes. It just popped in my head. Peter. Yeah, Peter saw Jesus coming. Oh, no, it's a ghost. Remember that part? <clears throat> it's a ghost. And then finally he gets closer and, and Jesus speaks. He said, oh, if it's really you. Now, Peter, I don't know what's going through his head. If it's really you, bid me to come out on the water. I would have said, Lord, if it's you, I would have said, stop the storm. <laughs> Build a bridge. <laughs> but to walk out on water. And what's Peter do? He gets out walking on the water and he's going towards Jesus. And all of a sudden, the wind blows. He takes his eyes off of Jesus and he begins to sink, right? And he prays the shortest prayer in the Bible. Lord, save. <laughs> That's pretty straightforward, right? And the Lord, oh, ye of little faith, puts him back in the boat. <clears throat> when he gets his eyes off the Lord and refocuses them on Christ, everything is better. Church is that kind of place. Every week, we try to refocus you back on Christ. Every week, every week. So you got to go to church. He says you got to go to church to understand some things. The first thing he's going to say is you got to go down to church to understand their final destiny. Whew. Most churches don't talk about this anymore. Afraid we might offend somebody. But the lost person is going to hell. That's it. He said when I went to let me ask you this. Where else do they talk about hell? Well, I know what you're going to say. You're going to say, my boss says, they talk to me all the time, you need to go too. <laughs> but I mean, where do you really talk about eternal consequences? Outside of church. Very rarely. You go to church to understand that there is more than this life and that there is eternal consequences. In fact, he goes on and he says, <clears throat> Jesus talks more about hell. He gave more description about hell than he did heaven. Did you know that? In the Gospels, Jesus gave us better picture of hell than he did heaven. He constantly said, enter into the kingdom of heaven. He spoke about the kingdom of heaven. But you, you search. He doesn't say much about what it's like. You've got to go to the book of Revelation to find that. But Jesus told us a lot about hell. Listen, he says, it's a place of eternal torment. It's a place of unquenchable fire. It is a place where the worm does not die. How do you like to spend the rest of eternity with the worm? And the point that it doesn't die is because it's eternal. It's a place of eternal, as he's going to go on and say, gnashing of teeth. That is not a pleasant thing. Listen, he tells us there is no return from it. He tells us that it's a place of outer darkness. <clears throat> it's not like you're going to be seeing a lot. It's dark. It's, it's terrible. In fact, he calls it Gehenna. Gehenna was the dump outside Jerusalem. There was always a fire going on there as you would dump stuff on it to burn it. And he says, <clears throat> he says that's what Hell is like. There's other things. I could, I could keep going on the list. Jesus told us a lot. He tells us it was prepared for the devil and his angels. It was never prepared for you. You only choose to go there because you choose to reject Jesus Christ. Wow. It's when you go to church that you get refocused on now in time and eternity because you are an eternal being. You will live beyond this short speck of a life. 
you will. Then he says this. Oh, here's the solution. They're slippery slopes for them too. <laughs> Surely you place them, the people I'm so concerned about, the unchurched, on slippery ground. You cast them down to ruin. How suddenly they are destroyed completely, swept away by terrors. Listen, if you think you got it bad here and now and they got it so good, you wait until they pass through the portal of death and they're on the other side. They're going to have it so terrible and we're going to have it so good. You learn that only at church. You get that hope only at church. You don't find that elsewhere. He says, their lives are nothing but a fantasy. As, as a dream, when one awakes, pff, it's gone. Every now and then I can remember the dream. But most of the time I say, man, I know I had a good dream, but I can't remember the dream. Why? Boom. It was gone because it was a fantasy. So when you rise, O oh Lord, you will despise them as fantasies. Though they're going to just be nothing but a poof. And they are gone. They are gone. He turns from them and he says, and looks at himself, and he says, when my heart and my spirit, he says, was embittered, I was senseless and ignorant. I was a brute beast. There is a um, form of insanity where people believe that they are animals. And Daniel chapter 3, King Nebuchadnezzar was smitten with that insanity. And for seven years, he was a king, but he went out and he thought he was an ox and he ate grass and he lived like a beast. And then it said, his finally, when he acknowledged God was the Most High, his insanity left him and he was restored back to his regular mind. This insanity is where the myth of werewolf comes from. Somebody thought they were a wolf, and they acted like a wolf, and out of that springs the whole mythology of a werewolf. It's an insanity. What he's saying, listen, when I'm questioning that God is only good, I am like an insane person who is just a beast because God is only good to him, to me. Just like Nebuchadnezzar, if I will confess my sin and say, Lord, you are most high, you will restore me. <clears throat> Where does that happen? That normally happens at church. At church. God uses his word to convict you and you change your heart and your attitude and you turn to him and say, Lord, you are most high in my life. I was nothing but a beast wandering away from you. And you come back to the Lord. <laughs> this is what he says next. <clears throat> At church, you learn about God's presence. Yet I am always with you. You hold me by my right hand. The focus is turning away from himself. Now he's beginning to talk about God. First it was about them. Then it was about me. And now he's inter introducing God, holding him by the right hand. Reminds me of Zephaniah chapter 3, verse 17. All right. For the Lord, the Lord your God is with you. He is mighty to save. There it is. He is with you. This is the same thing. He's saying it all over again. I am always with you. And we got to memorize that verse and say it and tell ourselves that. Listen, God guides us. Where do we learn that? We learn that at church. We learn that at church. You guide me, O oh God, and with your counsel. What is the counsel? I'm giving you the counsel from the Word of God. I put it up on the screens. You're reading the Word of God. I really want the Word to speak to you. and I'm just trying to illustrate it for you so you're pulling out of the Word what God has for you. <clears throat> you guide me with your counsel. and Afterward, you will take me to glory. I like the path on the screen much better than the flames that were up there. Amen? You will take me to glory... Then he says this, I love this. Whom have I in heaven but you? You got anybody else there? Who's going to rescue and help you? No, he's the one. And on earth, the earth has nothing I desire besides you. More than anything, Lord, 
I want to please you. I want to please you. Wow. He says, my flesh and my heart may fail. So I got the, the old electrocardiogram up there, and, and all of a sudden, my faith is like, oh, doubt has entered in. It's gone. And then the next part of the verse, but God is the strength of my heart. Ah, I go to church and I get recharged, reinvigorated. I get revived. Uh, there was a time when I was dead in my trespasses and sin and he infused life in me. And every now and then I start to doubt and I wander and I'm having like a cardiac arrest spiritually. And then I go to the house of the God and, and the, the word of the Lord is there and the people of God are there and they encourage and strengthen me and boom. It's like somebody put the paddles on my chest and gave me a jolt, boom. And I have fresh new spiritual life. I pick up my Bible and I read and I pray. And then by the end of the week, I've been run down by the world and I need it all over again. I need it all over again. Finally, it's God's nearness that uh, is really the solution here. Those who are far from you will perish. That's what John 3.16 says. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him shall not perish. But those who don't, they perish. But those who believe, they have everlasting life. You destroy all who are unfaithful to you, all without faith, all who do not believe. <clears throat> it's at church that I look and I see eternal destiny set before me and know that I've got to live for more than the moment. I've got to live for eternity. I live for eternity. He says, but as for me, it is good to be near God. There's this nearness of God that I find at church. It's almost as if I'm singing those songs and those praise words and I'm praying and, and all the things, the sermon's going on and it's just like God is just drawing me nearer and nearer in my heart to Him. I just get closer and closer to God. I have made the Sovereign Lord my refuge. I will tell of all your deeds. Wow. What can we take away today? What can we take away today? It's a good thing to enter the house of the Lord. <laughs> Amen? <laughs> you got to go to church. Folks, hey, you, you that are watching online, you got to go to church. I, I don't care if you're on vacation. It's better to go and worship somewhere. You can watch us later. You know that. You got to go to church. If you're having a hard time with the preacher, find a preacher somewhere else. But you got to go to church. You got to go to church. You got to go to church. Jesus said, I will build my church. In the age in which we live, his primary focus is the church. It's the church. And we know it's not this building, but it's the people in the building. We are the called out assembly of people. We are the church. And the way you go to church is you gather together with the Christians who meet in this local space and at this local time you meet with us. You go to church. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we are so very thankful for the, the, this psalm. Psalm 73. And how important it is to enter into the sanctuary of God and find you here. I pray, O oh Lord, that you've spoken to our hearts how urgent and necessary that it is to be in church. May we encourage those that don't go to church to come with us to church. Especially, Lord, as we face a Holy Week coming up. Next Sunday, the launch of a whole week, and we set aside to worship you. Oh God, every one of those services gives us an opportunity to invite someone. Put it on our heart to invite others to join us in church. We know they will be better for it, they will be healthier for it, and they will live longer for it. So Lord, put it on our hearts to invite people to church. In Jesus' name, amen.